The G Skill Ripjaws KM570 gaming keyboard features genuine Cherry MX mechanical switches, customizable per key lighting effects and macro support, full end key rollover, and more. Click the link in the description for more details. Excellent! What's up guys, welcome to my monthly build video series. I am testing this build today, the mini ITX build that I did recently in the Corsair 380T. This was a $1,700-ish semi-portable gaming and video editing build that I made largely due to random decisions that I made about what I thought I wanted and perhaps less about what you guys might want. But more on that in just a second. This system features four SSDs, an i7-6700K, as well as a GTX 1070 from Galax. Uh, so it's made for gaming as well as video editing and all of it of course in the practically unobtainable Corsair 380T case, a discovery that I made a little bit too late to uh, go back on what I was doing in this video, but never mind, I still had fun. So let's do the uh, right thing first and start with the negatives. Like pulling off a band-aid, it's going to be quick and painful. So what I didn't like about this build after testing it and using it for a while was first the Galax 1070 RGB LED lighting control just wasn't quite up to what I was hoping for. The software itself was functional, but the LED options on the card are limited by the always-on red LEDs that are on the fans. With the white case fan that I have on the 380T, I had pretty much three color combinations available. I nicknamed them Patriot, Yule, and of course my favorite, Tequila Sunrise. Anyway, the software has a color wheel and a few basic effects. It gets the job done, but my main disappointment was finding out that the fan LEDs are static red, and you can't turn them off either, even though you can turn off the backplate LED, so your matching LED color options are very limited, which is a shame. There was some mild coil wine from the GPU under load, but nothing too terrible, uh, and then a couple negatives when it comes to the case. Two of them, actually, and they're pretty substantial, uh, the availability and the size. Now, I will admit that I always kind of liked the 380T. It has a unique design and I kind of have a thing for cases with handles, at least mini ITX cases. It launched back in 2014, but I actually never got to build in it. It is end of life now. Corsair is not making them anymore. And uh, their web store that I thought had them for sale just links to dead pages on web retail outlets and on eBay you can find them, but they are ridiculously overpriced. Uh, I also called this case semi-portable. You can carry it with the handle up on top, but it's definitely too big to fly with as like a carry-on if you're going somewhere a little bit more remote. So size-wise, as many ITX cases go, it is definitely on the much larger side. So I completely admit this case choice was a bit odd, but I still had fun building in it, so there is that. What I liked about this build, and I'll keep this part simple, is one, that it's air-cooled, and since this is intended to be a production machine, I like to stay away from liquid cooling for that reason. Air coolers, I think, just do a good job, and they can't have like a pump fail and stop working all of a sudden. Also, good overclocking, not great overclocking, but definitely good overclocking, I think, thanks to the uh, airflow that's available in the case, as well as just some higher quality components in there, limited slightly by the motherboard, but more on that in a minute. Uh, and then it easily was able to handle gaming at 2560 by 1440 which I think is a good sweet spot for the 1070 and also video editing was nice and smooth as well and even the rendering output times were not bad uh, for a four core processor. Uh, also easy to move around or relatively easy thanks again to that handle up on top. Now let's move on to some testing. Overclocking, temperatures, and noise to begin with. Uh, the CPU overclock I hit was 4.4 gigahertz at 1.35 volts. Now this 6700K I have in here I know can do 4.7 gigahertz stable but not with this motherboard. As previously mentioned the Z170N Wi-Fi from Gigabyte is not really an overclocking board. The power delivery is just not up to snuff for that so I I ran into some stability problems when I was testing this system back when I was working with it a few months ago. And uh, since 4.4 gigahertz was stable, I was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with that. That's perfectly adequate for me. Uh, the GPU overclock was a little bit better. I used Galaxy's Extreme Tuner Plus software that covers uh, the basics, so you got some speed gauges on there. Uh, there are a few conservative preset one-click overclocks that you can engage. There is voltage control, and you got your typical sliders for GPU clock and all that good stuff. 
Also in the settings, there are some startup options and there is an in-game overlay you can turn on to show frames per second and GPU frequency and that kind of thing. You can save and load a profile with this software, but what it's really missing is like a profile system so you can easily switch between the different settings that you might save. So you can have like a, you know, base non-overclock one and then an overclock one and then a really overclock one. Uh, but also the ability to key in values directly would be really welcome here. You can only use the sliders, which is just a little cumbersome and not very accurate. So the GPU overclock clock out of the box, since this is an overclock card, was 1595 megahertz base clock, 1785 boost, 1936 was the average I achieved under load while testing briefly uh, without overclocking it further myself. I then of course overclocked it further myself uh, with the power and temperature sliders maxed out uh, and then I set the fan speed to run at 60% all the time. I did plus 126 on the GPU offset and plus 202 on the memory offset and that gave me a base clock of 1721, a boost of 1911. It peaked at over 2100 megahertz but if you've used any of these Pascal cards you know that that is just a brief fleeting moment of glory and when the temperatures actually rise up it levels out to something a little bit more reasonable. So about 2020 to 2037 megahertz was what this was running at under load, hitting the uh, top temperature that these cards are supposed to hit, which is about 81 to 82 degrees Celsius. Uh, as for temperatures overall, since I just mentioned them, uh, the ambient temperature here in my garage is cooler since it is winter now, 21 to 23 degrees Celsius. Uh, CPU temperatures while overclocked at idle were 21 to 25 degrees Celsius. 68C while gaming, 77C while stress testing, which is a little bit high, I think mainly due to the voltage, but again, since I was stable, I didn't really mess with that too much. GPU temperatures at idle were 50 degrees Celsius, and that is with the fan off mode, since the fans don't spin unless the card actually has a load on it. Uh, hit 84C max while I was doing some stress testing, but after adjusting some things and ramping up the fan speed with my overclock, I hit 70C under moderate gaming load, and then of course it was peaking at right about 80 to 81, at which point the frequency would drop off, and you know, that's how GPU boost is supposed to work. And now let's do some noise testing. This is with the GPU fan set at 60%. Uh, I was just running Unigen Valley on a loop, and uh, here's what it sounds like. Of course, you get bonus points there if you can hear Hero snoring in the background, which he always does. Let's move into some actual game testing, though. I ran 3D Mark as a synthetic test. Fire Strike Extreme hit 8,651 on the overall score, 9,377 on the graphics. Fire Strike Ultra hit 4,747 overall, 4,731 on the graphics. And 3D Mark Time Spy hit 6,045 overall, 6,225 on the graphics, and 5,198 on the CPU. GTA 5, and the rest of these tests are at 2560 by 1440 by the way, was 95.2 average frames per second, so well above 60. And Civ 6, a new test since I just recently got the game, uh, running at Ultra by the way in DirectX 12 mode at 2560 by 1440. Graphics test hit 13.4 milliseconds average frame time, that equates to about 74 to 75 frames per second, and the 99th percentile result was 17.2 milliseconds. The AI test, which is more of a CPU test, had an average turn time of 16. One, three seconds. Finally, Overwatch, 2560 by 1440, 139 average frames per second. Um, just Overwatch is a fun game, so everyone go play it. Uh, and then, of course, the productivity test, since I will be using this for video editing, and this is uh, just testing with Adobe Premiere CS6. Uh, time timeline scrubbing and playback was pretty good on a 4K project. 4K can get choppy at times, depending on what you're using for the resolution playback, but I found it to be adequate compared to the desktops that I use. And then I did a 4K render for a project that's about 6 minutes and 15 seconds long. The render time at 4K for 45 megabits per second was 15 minutes and 29 seconds, a little bit more than twice the length of the project. That is with some transitions and overlays in, involved in the project as well. And again, perfectly adequate and what I would expect from a 6700K at this frequency. And so in conclusion, I do once again wish those fan LEDs on the Galax card were also RGB or just that they could be turned off. I think that would be nice. Uh, but this system is damn quiet and damn powerful. I don't know if you've even noticed it's been on. Hopefully you've noticed the lights are on. But it has been on this whole time. Can't really hear it very well. Uh, and then I will say that that uh, Galax uh, GTX 1070, despite my quibbles about the aesthetics, did hit a very nice overclock. Nothing crazy out of the ordinary, but uh, was nice and stable. And uh, again, 
nice and quiet too. So that's all for this video guys. Uh, of course you can vote in some of the straw polls I have down below. I'm just asking you guys for some feedback for how I do these monthly build videos coming in 2017. Check out my builds playlist there too if you want to see more builds that might be a little bit more reasonable, uh, at least maybe in a case that you can actually buy. And then of course stay tuned for more videos coming very soon on my channel. Links are also down below for my store where you can buy shirts, mugs, and pint glasses. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and like the video on your way out. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more. And as always, thanks for watching.